Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Everybody in the back? Raise your hand if you can't hear me. All right, very good. Um, again, welcome, everybody. Uh, altar flowers this morning are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Barb and Goth Garth Plosky in an honor of Kendra Plosky from Susie Burkhart and family. Um, happy birthday later on this week to Maria Foxall. And uh, the events this week, uh, pretty much on the uh, our light and on the uh, bulletin here, but uh, Tuesday evening Bible study continues at 6 p.m. via Zoom. And if anybody's interested that hasn't been attending, please uh, let us know. We'll get you the link. It's, uh, it's, it's been good and growing and very enjoyable. Okay, well, with that, um, Let's, let's read our call to worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 33. And excuse the fact that I'm using my phone for this, but Isaiah, chapter 33, verses 13 through 15. Hear God's word. You who are far away, hear what I have done. And you who are near, acknowledge my might. Sinners in Zion are terrified, trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can live with the consuming fire? Who among us can live with everlasting burning? One who walks righteously and speaks with integrity. One who rejects unjust gain and shakes his hands so that they hold no bribe. One who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking at evil. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we bow before you this morning together. We bow our hearts and we pray. Lord, we pray under the wings of the righteous one. We pray we prepare our hearts for worship in spirit and in truth now. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. If you would stand and join me for our opening hymn found on page 323. <clears throat> holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Good morning. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Our uh, New Testament reading this morning is Luke chapter 8 and verses 22 to 25. And we're taking a break from Leviticus this morning. We're looking at Psalm 24. Uh, but as we look at Psalm 24, I want you to be thinking about the things we have looked at in Leviticus. So, um, the holiness of God and how the unholy uh, profane is made right to enter into the holiness, the presence of God. So, we'll think about those things. We'll look at Psalm 24, but now we're looking at Luke chapter 8, and these are 22, verses 22 to 25. It's a very short passage, but it'll play a role in Psalm 24. So let's read that brief passage here. Luke 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, and verses 22 to 25. And this is with Jesus in the boat with his disciples. Now on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, Let's, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And so they launched out. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep. And a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. And they came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Here ends the reading of God's word. Okay, so we're celebrating the supper today, so uh, we don't have a <clears throat> confession of faith, although I think you still have your confession of faith, don't you? Is that right? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. We'll go right to our time of prayer. And as is our practice, I'll give you a moment to pray silently and then lead us in prayer. And, uh, and I'll close, but we'll save the Lord's Prayer as we usually do uh, for the supper, for after the supper. Um, but it is a prayer of confession of sin and the seeking of assurance of pardon. And it is intercessory as well. So we'll pray for those who are in our hearts and minds today. So let's do that. Let's. Uh, Come to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we thank you for who you are as the Holy One of Israel. The psalmist loves you because you hear. You hear our voices, you hear our supplications, our needs. And we are reminded in this that you are not only holy, but compassionate and merciful as well. And therefore, like the psalmist, we should call upon you often, much, all the days of our lives. There are times when we feel great distress, times when we think even the cords of death surround us but we can call upon you. 
who are gracious and righteous and compassionate to preserve us, to keep us, to rescue us. For in you is safety and life and what it means to be truly human. And so, Father, we come in this way to confess our sin before you today. To say that we have failed you. To acknowledge our faults before you. And to find in your presence the forgiveness so graciously offered in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to understand that. To realize that we, in his name, may stand in your holy place. Having been cleansed of our unrighteousness. That is our assurance. It is not in us, but in him. We thank you for that. To know that we are yours and you are ours is covenant. Father, we pray <clears throat> not only for our forgiveness of sin as your people and the assurance that we are your people, but we also pray for those who struggle today. Our loved ones, our friends, our acquaintances, our Folks that we don't even know, those who are connected to us in some form or fashion, we lift them up to you. We pray for those who are in pain and those who struggle. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for those who do not know you. We ask, O oh Lord, that you open hearts today. We pray for Randy Fisher and his mom. We pray for Diane Lynn's sister. And we continue to think of Joe and Linda as she heals and as he is with her most every day. We pray for the Engelmans. We pray for Carol, Lynn's mom, and Gwen, the one who is a missionary and yet home here for the meantime. We pray that you bring healing and encouragement to her in this off season, so to speak. We pray for Iris and Susie and Barb, we pray for Nora and Bill and John, Brenda and Ron. We think of June. Father, we lift him up to you, that you strengthen and encourage him. We would long to see him be able to come, join us in worship. We pray for Mary Sinibaldi, Barb's sister. We thank you that she supports us. She is an encouragement, prays for us. We thank you for all your people who do such things. And even though they may feel sometimes absent from the body, they are very much a part of it. And so we commit them to you. We pray for our congregation, all those who have come this morning, we lift them up to you. We pray for our consistory, for the missions of the church. We pray for growth and love and number and all of these things. We think of your body around the world. We ask that you bring encouragement to it. Again, you are the Holy One of Israel and you are shaping your people as a temple where you dwell. 
Help us to understand these things in greater ways. For we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. up the step again. <laughs> so, I'm here. Sorry, that's a, I'll explain later. Um, okay, so it's time for the young people's message already. Um, so let's talk about that. I think we've talked about this before, young people. Um, do you remember what's called the doctrine of clean hands? Clean hands. The teaching, doctrine is just teaching, right? So teaching of clean hands. It essentially says that if you want to have, uh, it's kind of court related, right? Judicial, if you will. But if you want to have the court find in your favor, then you must not be involved in bad behavior, especially in relation to the matter in which you're seeking uh, to be justified. So let's say, and I think examples always help, but let's say you go to your mom and dad and say, 
Susie took my game controller. And when mom and dad call Susie over and say, did you take his game controller? And in other words, they're trying to find justice, right? Uh, they find out, and Susie tells them, that you took her game in the first place. So uh, you're in a position of not having clean hands because you started the whole process. So really, you're the one who has unclean hands, and therefore you cannot expect justice when your actions themselves are unjust. That's the teaching of clean hands. So um, that's what we, when we want to expect justice or things to go our way, we want to have clean hands. Um, so our text today mentions this phrase, actually, having clean hands. Does it mean, and this is a question I'll ask, does it mean something similar to what we're talking about? So I want you to listen to the text and the message and let me know afterward, what is the situation in which this phrase, to have clean hands, is actually mentioned? We're in Psalm 24, we're going to hear that. So I want you to listen to the text and the message, let me know. So what would be the treat for this idea? We're talking about having clean hands. And I, I get some of you are whispering back and forth as to what this could be. But we're talking about having clean hands. So. Really, you can't have butter fingers. You've got to have the clean hands. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege it is to speak to these young hearts and young minds. And we pray for them that as they discover more and more about you in your word, that they discover what it means to have clean hands. And so we pray this not only for them, but for each of us. And we ask it to the glory of Christ. Amen. Okay, our text this morning is Psalm 24. We're in the Psalter. And I'm going to just get a quick drink before I start. Okay. <clears throat> so we're reading Psalm 24, and it is uh, a short 10 verses. So follow along with me if you're willing and able there. Uh, open your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible to open and read, let me know after, because I want everybody, I would encourage everybody to have a Bible to open and to read as we read the scripture. I think that's really important. I haven't mentioned that before, but I just assumed it. Uh, so I don't want to assume it anymore. So let's, let's make sure everybody's got a Bible and reading it. All right, Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. 
He is the King of glory. Here ends the reading of God's Word. Now that was from the New American Standard, so if it differs from your translation, uh, let me know. Um, we'll talk about some of the words, but you never know. You might have something where you have a question, and we can always talk about that. So, um, okay. As you may know, I did a 50K trail run yesterday in Ohio. Um, and so that may explain some of my hobbling and why I'm wearing tennis shoes and not dress shoes. Um, but just about every time, now I don't know if you're familiar with a trail run, but a trail run is unlike a road run in that it's on a trail and it's usually up and down hills. So just about every time I reach the base of a hill yesterday, I asked myself two questions. One that kept going around in my head was, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? And the other one was, who knew there were hills in Ohio? <laughs> yeah, was a, um, so we're talking about ascending a mountain today in our text. <clears throat> Not in Ohio, but Mount Zion. And it's really all about entering the presence of God. So I'd like us to reflect upon what we find in the poetry here in the psalm, the prayer and praise of David, and what we have been talking about in Leviticus, this cultic journey into the presence of God. This is what Psalm 24 is all about. Receiving the blessing and righteousness found in the saving presence of the Lord of glory. Receiving the blessing and righteousness found in the saving presence of the Lord of glory. And just some context here. Again, some of you have heard this, I don't know how many times, but I always like to say it. The Psalms are like a, a microcosm of Scripture's overall message and teaching. You remember what microcosm is, young people? It's that in miniature, right? So it's a microcosm of Scripture's overall message in the Psalms. That's what we find. So we're in the realm of Hebrew poetry. That means there are parallel lines, those things that are, you'll see lines that repeat, and um, they may say the same thing. They may advance the thought. They may contrast the thought but they are parallel lines, unlike our English poetry. And there are figures of speech. <clears throat> there's metaphor, there's hyperbole, there's synecdoche, there's metonymy. There's all of those things. And as I said, there's parallelisms. Lines of thought that repeat, contrast, or advance the idea. And since Hermann Gunkel's work, we often talk about the Psalms in terms of category. Hymn, praise, lament, Wisdom, thanksgiving, royal, enthronement, liturgy, all of these different categories of psalms when we read them. And some of them uh, kind of go between, right? Something can be a lament, something can be praise, something can be thanksgiving or wisdom as well. The absence of specific context with the psalms, with what we find sometimes, the absence of a specific context invites the reader to find his own circumstances shaped by the psalm's biblical message. Psalm 24 has three parts, uh, which does create a challenge for us in fitting them together, how they actually fit together, but we'll talk about it. The first part is the opening that's identifying Yahweh, that name of the covenant Lord, with Elohim, the creator. The second part is often referred to as the entrance liturgy or entrance Torah. It asks a question. The worshiper is asking a question. Like Psalm 15 and like Isaiah 33, just as we heard earlier. The third part, and perhaps the oldest element of, of the psalm itself, is sometimes called liturgy at the gate. Liturgy at the gate. So with its liturgy, its antiphonal 
questions. That's the back and forth. And the overall teaching, Psalm 24, may tick several of those genre boxes. I'd like us to consider the psalm from the overarching theme we've been seeing in the Pentateuch and in Leviticus as the center of the five books, namely, dwelling in the presence of Yahweh. And that is that journey into his presence. This is what we're talking about. So we're going to break it up into the three sections, verses 1 and 2 first. Lord of creation. The psalm begins by acknowledging Yahweh as the creator of all. And the words recall Genesis 1 and 2. Yahweh, the covenant Lord, is Elohim. So we recall, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving or hovering over the surface of the waters. Do you remember that from Genesis 1? And Peter Craigie identifies a connection here to the Canaanite cosmogony, that is, Canaanite uh, creation story. And he says, with the words the psalmist uses here for sea and river, Yam and Nahar, in Canaanite mythology, these words represented a threat to order. And the subjugation of these chaotic forces by Baal, the Canaanite god, established Baal as king in the Canaanite understanding. And so what Craigie is saying here is, note these things. He contends that the psalmist is using these terms in a demythologized or depersonified way, depicting forcefully Yahweh's creation of an ordered world, symbolizing the subdued forces of chaos. And I think this resonates with the metaphors of Scripture. The chaos of the waters on one hand, the safety of the high ground in the mountain of God. Those things come through time and again. And perhaps that is what's being said here. So I want you to think again of Israel brought out of Egypt, passing through the waters and coming to the mountain, the presence of God. So it is perhaps here that the psalmist is taking note. You know, you've got this idea of the earth as an island sitting in the sea, floating, as it were, above the waters or on the waters. In other words, God's sovereignty over the chaos and the establishment of order. Kind of a kingship here. Not kind of, but really. All right, then we move to the center verses and what we, what is often called the entrance liturgy or entrance Torah. The questions and the questions, the questions that deserve answers. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Order and chaos here seem to transition in this section to moral good and evil. There is the question, the response, and the affirmation. Who shall ascend in? That's a base preposition in the Hebrew. Who may ascend in? <laughs> Which I found odd. And the translations um, render it differently, but some say into. Who, who may ascend into the hill of uh, the Lord? Or some say who may ascend or go up? Who shall go up? to uh, the mountain of the Lord. In any case, who shall ascend in the mountain of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? There you have parallelism, right? Mountain of the Lord, his holy place, it's really about his presence. In its liturgical sense, this entrance liturgy, again, Peter Craigie notes, a ritual was enacted which was the necessary precursor to participation in worship. So the worshiper is coming. They're arriving either at the base of the Temple Mount or at the base of the temple or at the front of the temple, the entrance to the temple. And they're asking 
likely the priest who may enter. Who may enter. And the priest explains in moral terms, not ritual. He who has a clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. It's an outward clean and an inward clean. As Psalm 1 opens the Psalter, you cannot expect the blessing of God apart from living in a morally and religiously authentic way with Yahweh and other people. This is that idea, uh, what we refer to and what we were talking about earlier with the doctrine of clean hands. There's an expectation. You can't expect what you yourself are not willing uh, to do. So if you want to be in relationship with God, able to stand in his presence and live in his safety and protection and blessing, then you must be innocent in action and thought and not raising the mind or giving adoration and worship in prayer and praise to false gods. That's what this idea of uh, lifting up, this lifting up your soul, it means raising the mind. In other words, worshiping is the picture here, false gods. Or of taking oaths of untruth in God's name. But here you are to have the clean hearts, uh, clean hands and pure hearts. Now it doesn't mean you're to be absolutely perfect here. This isn't what it is about. It's about the authenticity of wanting to be in the presence of God and to being in a right relationship with God and with others at the point you are coming. And it's to those who find themselves here in this position the priest says these shall receive. The results of their worship shall be a blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of their salvation. The worshipers then affirm this is the generation of those who seek him, who seek his face, even Jacob. And so in this affirmation with hearing what the priest is saying, the clean hands, the pure heart, and so forth, the worshiper then affirms that they know the implications and they're not, they're not absolutely without sin, but they desire it to be. So think about, in this case, if we were to think of the New Testament, Luke 18 and the tax collector, when he comes for morning or evening worship, and he says, he beats his breast and he says, God, make an atoning sacrifice for me, the sinner. He's coming with an authenticity. He's coming with an expectation. So we then move to the last section, the kingship of Yahweh. A closing then that mirrors the opening. And the picture portrayed in these verses is like the Ark of the Covenant representing the presence of God returning from battle. And is the, the, they are saying as they come, as they bring the Ark, open the gates that the Lord may come in. And the interesting part is that the King of Glory here is on the outside, is on the outside coming in. And the questions and answers are about wanting to know who this king of glory is. That's a very important part of our relationship with God, wanting to know who he is. The responses are put in military type terms. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies. He is the king of glory. So the king of glory is the one who achieves victory over his enemies. And these verses picture then the victorious return of the warrior God to his people. 
and they perhaps reflect the opening verses in terms of Yahweh's sovereignty over the chaos. His power to bring order. His sovereignty over evil. And his ability to bring about goodness. A few points of application and we move to the supper. Now, through its questions and answers, Psalm 24 teaches the reader about who God is. He is king, sovereign, over the chaos of the cosmos, over moral good and evil, the nature and character of those who desire to ascend and stand in his holy presence. In this way, the psalm is didactic. It's a wisdom psalm. It's teaching. And the result of worshiping the one true God, the king of glory, those results are blessing and righteousness, the God of their salvation. When we look at the life of Jesus, the one who calms the storms, stills the sea, the one who holds power and authority over the unseen world of the demons, the one who is able to heal the sick and restore life itself, we realize that he, Jesus, is the fullest expression of Psalm 24, the Lord of glory. John says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Peter writes, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In John's revelation, he sees and says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh... He has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Who is the King of Glory? It's Jesus of Nazareth. He is the King of Glory. Receiving the blessing and righteousness found in the saving presence of the Lord of Glory. That's what Psalm 24 is all about. So let's move to the supper, the meal that Jesus gave us. And I will be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Words of Institution. So this is given for those who believe, those who have been baptized and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who make that confession of faith. And it is a meal that joins us together, that we come as his people, <clears throat> redeemed by his blood. And we share in the things that unite us in that. It is an organic relationship that we have with one another and with him. And so he gives us this meal to celebrate in anticipation of that great meal to come. And so I'll read these words, then we'll pray, and then we'll distribute the bread and the cup. For I received from him, I'm sorry, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you that we can come into your presence even now to celebrate the meal which you have given us. And as we remember the Christ who has established it, we pray that you would set apart the elements to be used from a common to a sacred use. We lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's distribute the bread. His body, which is for you, take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us distribute the cup.
the cup of the new covenant in his blood, take and drink. <clears throat> For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's close with the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join me for our closing hymn. Found on page 118, <clears throat> A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We will sing the first, third, and fourth verse. People of God, receive the blessing that comes from our God. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the ever-abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.
you for joining us. That concludes the service. Have a blessed week.